Well, good morning. Hey, I'm glad you've joined us today. We're uh, actually kicking off a brand new message series. Everybody say it together. Me called Love and... Right, yeah. So we're going to kick it off today because this is the month of February, which is the month of... And all that stuff, yeah, because it kind of all, all, all goes together. And, uh, you know, some of you may have gotten uh, uh, the invitation card. I hope maybe you shared it with somebody. That's why we provide these a couple weeks ahead of time that maybe it sparks something. But let me just read you a little blurb on the back. It says in the back, falling in love is easy, but staying in love, that's a whole other thing, right? It's easy to meet someone. You get an app, you swipe right, you sign up on a site. Yeah, don't laugh at that part, yeah. The real challenge is creating something that stands the test of time. And we know that, right? I mean, falling in love is the easy part. It's the stay in love that, 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 that kind of is the challenge at times. And here's kind of where we're going today and uh, over the next couple of weeks. You may want to write this down. And here's the, here's the kind of the basis, the true statement that we're basing this all on. Number one, that you're equipped to fall in love. So write that down. You're equipped to fall in love. And we're going to do a little test this morning to prove that to you. So uh, if you're by yourself, I want you to take and put two fingers on your wrist, fingers on your neck, or your heart, wherever you can kind of feel your heartbeat, all right? If you're with somebody, you can put two fingers on their neck, or their hands, or their neck, but not the other spot, all right? And if you're just kind of starting to date somebody, you know, this is your perfect opportunity to take, you know, real gently hold their wrist, you know, look into their eyes, you know. But hopefully as you do that, you're going to feel a pulse, right? And that's important. Because you know what, how you're equipped to fall in love? You have a pulse, right? I mean, falling in love's easy, right? It's the butterflies, it's the walking on the moonlit beach. Maybe it's unicorns for you. But, but in fact, the reality is, we all know it's so easy to fall in love. Some of you have fallen in love multiple times in your life, right? Some of you have fallen in love with people who don't even know you. You know, you saw them on TV, in the movies. Maybe you had posters as you were growing up on your walls, and it was like, oh. You know, maybe you practiced writing, the, you know, your last name is their last name, or, you know, kind of putting a little heart. It, we, we all know that it is easy, so, so easy to fall in love, right? The challenge is the whole staying in love part. Because the reality is while you're equipped to fall in love, you're not equipped to stay in love. I mean, you think about it. Where do you ever learn what, how it looks to stay in love? For most of us, the, 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 most, the, the place where we got our greatest amount of learning was either from our parents or from movies. So in two hours' time, we're able to watch on a movie this great falling in love picture. But do you notice how, how rarely it is to see a movie that talks about staying in love? In fact, how rarely is to see a movie about two married people who are, have fallen in love and are staying in love. Normally it's about two singles, or one married and one, or two people not married to see each other, and it's all about, oh, and it's about the feeling and the emotions, and oh, I just, oh, we all I cried, you know, it was so sad, you know, and, you know, and we go through all this kind of emotions, and for a lot of us, you know, our parents weren't necessarily the best examples of what it means to stay in love. You know, some of us grew up in homes where you know, our parents were together, but we all knew that they weren't really together. You know, dad did his thing, she did her, mom did her thing. You know, the only time they really talked with each other wasn't a really very good thing for us, you know. If your parents were really nice to you, they would go argue in a, in a closed room, right, because they didn't want to argue in front of the kids. How many of you have parents like that? I, we don't argue in front of the kids. All right. So, and some of you think, hey, that's the way we do it. Let me tell you a little, little parenting secret. Argue in front of the kids. But do it nicely and resolve it in front of the kids. Don't throw things. Don't raise your voice too loud, right? I say too loud because sometimes to get our points across, guys, we got to raise it up just a little bit, right? What about there's good? Here's terrible. Here's good, all right? But here's the route. This is a little second note. The route is if your kids never see you fighting, they don't know how to deal with fighting. And here's the reality. Every relationship I've ever been in, has had some of the fighting as part of it. That's a relationship of, of romantic. That's a relationship of friends. 
That's a relationship at work. There's always some tension, right? Because sometimes you step on each other's toes or somebody says something or does something. You've got to have a little moment of tension. And if we never learn how to deal with that, everything's like, everything's great. Go to bed, boys and girls, because mommy and daddy got to talk. <laughs> and I grew up in a home where, where my folks did not fight in front of the kids. But my bedroom was right next to my parents' bedroom. And I learned, I learned a little bit about uh, about fighting. Uh, didn't hear a real little, a great amount about resolving things. But it's important for us to know that, that while you're, we're all equipped to fall on them, if you've got a pulse, if you're breathing, you're there. But we are so poorly, poorly prepared and poorly equipped to stay in love. You know, the reality is that nobody plans to mess up their life, right? I've done a lot of premarital counseling over the course of my, my pastoring, you know, it's sort of a requirement, you got to come to premarital counseling before I'll marry you or, or anybody on our staff will marry you because we think that's important, you know, but I've never had said, said to Caesar, had somebody say to me, oh, you know, Mike, I figure I'm going to give it a good two or three years and then, you know, it's going to go to pot, you know, my, my whole family's done this and now I'm going to find us. Nobody ever says, everybody goes like, oh, you know, but while nobody plans to mess up their life, our problem is we just don't plan not to. Because we get all these examples about what it looks like to fall in love. We have, we have songs, love songs, famous love songs that are written about falling in love, right? But the idea of staying in love. But there's something that resonates in all of us. Even if you're in a, in a, in a not a great relationship right now, or you're looking for a relationship, you're kind of trying to make sense out of what's going on, there's something that resonates in all of us, and that's this idea that it's possible for somebody to stay in love for a long, long time. Even if we haven't had examples around us, maybe our, both of our parents, you know, split up, maybe our, a bunch of our friends have split up, and we kind of go, oh, it's possible, but maybe not probable, but, you know, we, we hold on to this idea that, that maybe, maybe, maybe we can figure out, we can find something, find something that'll, that'll help us to stay together. But here's one of the reasons I think we don't plan not to. You know, one of, the, one of the sad things about doing a lot of premarital counseling is sometimes you sit across the table from two people who are just in love. It tends to be more when they're younger than when they're older. I've, I've done premarital with, you know, 18-year-olds, and oh, man, just kill me right now. It's, I mean, it's just painful to watch. <clears throat> you know, you go through this process, you know. Are you going to go to school? No. You got a job? Well, I work part-time at the pizza place. Where are you going to live? My mom's basement. <laughs> but we love each other. And there's just something about that. But, but the problem is, it's not just them. All of us sort of think we're the exception, right? You know, I need some help. Maybe I should get some, you know, maybe I need some. But no, no, I'm the exception. I got this figured out, you know. Everybody else doesn't, but, but I'm going to do okay here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this work. I'm going to find a way to get from here to there. You know, it's not us. It's, it's everybody else. But here's the problem. <clears throat> the problem with every relationship <clears throat> So don't look at the person next to you right at the moment. Just think to yourself, why am I in this relationship? And if you're honest, you're going to admit part of it is to get. Get something that makes you feel good. I mean, one of our great lines in our culture is, you complete me, right? Ah, oh, they just complete me, oh I just embrace that. Just hold it for a second because it feels good. They complete me. But at that core, that, that statement itself proves this, right? Because without you, baby, 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 oh, baby, I'm not whole. But with you, we're whole, right? <laughs> but we get him to get something. I mean, that, that, it's just the reality of what we are. And it's not like we're bad about it. I'm trying to get this off the other person. But it's just sort of how we're wired and how things work out in life. We're looking for something that we need for this other person. And the problem is we kind of discover it and think, oh, they're really cute. So, hey, that, that kind of makes a big check. It's a really big check. It kind of covers all those other things that I'm looking for. But at some point, 
the cuteness kind of wears off, or we begin to notice some other things that begin to really irritate us, and we think, oh, you know, how did I get to this place? How did I get this place where this person I couldn't live without, and now I can't stand to be in the same room with? And then this person who I thought was all the stuff, now it seems they're just this piece of stuff. And at the bottom of your outline, and actually up here, uh, there's some things needed for a healthy relationship. These are from sociologists and psychologists. They come up with this list of things that if you want to have a really healthy relationship, you need these things, you need these things in abundance. Look at this list. And isn't that what we look for in a relationship? We want somebody to respect us. We want encouragement, right? We want comfort. We want support. We want security. We want affection. We want acceptance. We want approval. We want protection. We want appreciation. And those are the things that we go into relationships wanting to get. And they're not necessarily bad. But we have to be honest with ourselves. That's what we're trying to get. We're trying to get something out of this as opposed to just simply giving something to this. And so today we're going to look at a, <clears throat> at a statement that Jesus makes. That I'll tell you right up front. When he says it, you're going to be tempted to go, Pfft. so everybody get it out of the way right now. Everybody go with me, Pfft. all right? Don't spit on people around you. That was, that was really strong. <clears throat> Just a simple, Pfft. yeah, all right. Because you're going to be tempted. When you see this, you're going to go, Pfft. yeah, really? You know, that doesn't, that doesn't work. That's too simple. But don't mistake, and don't confuse simple with powerless, all right? Sometimes we think things got to be deep and hard for us to understand. But what Jesus is going to tell us is so simple but so hard to do. And it will be hardly simple because it's simply hard. So before we jump over there to what Jesus says, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray uh, one more time together, okay? Father, in this space right now, here in this room or around this world online someplace, we find ourselves in different stages of love. Some of us are looking for it. Some of us have lost it. Some of us are just discovering it. Some of us are in that stage of, oh, everything is just perfect. And some of us in this room are trying to get it back. And all I ask this this morning is that you would help us to do just that. That this thing that you put in all of us, this belief, in spite of everything that goes on around us, this belief that, that it's possible to fall in love and to stay in love. And I pray that you would take that, that belief in each of us and give us a basis, something to do, some way to think to make it a reality. And so today we ask you again to speak to us through these words that were recorded a long time ago, but that can still have power today. And if you can do that for us, we will be forever thankful. Amen. I'm going to turn this around because somebody put tape on this and my pants keep sticking I'm going to have a big sticky patch, and this is going to look bad, and somebody's going to come up between services and say, do you know that you have tape residue in the back of your pants? And my answer is going to be, yeah, yeah. so I, I know, so you don't have to tell me, all right? But do tell me if something's stuck there, all right? Because that would be, that could be bad. <clears throat> all right, here we go. You Ready? Here's the thing that Jesus says, and again, it's sort of one of those things that Jesus so often does. You know, he says something, and it kind of catches us off guard, or he says something, and it's so sort of counterintuitive. It sounds so, uh, so kind of basic, and, but here's the words of Jesus. And and a little context, Jesus, this comes in the stage of Jesus' life, literally just hours before he's going to get arrested, and, and drug around all these different places, and ultimately crucified, and ultimately die from that. 
And so this has sort of been one of these final stages for, for Jesus. And so he's trying to say something into his group of guys there that will last him. You know, Judas has left. Judas has already gone on to, to kind of sell out Jesus. And as to, after he's left, Jesus is there with the other 11. And he says to them this. I give you a new commandment. And for that group, that was important because commandments are what God did. God gave ten commandments. And so when Jesus says, I'm going to give you a commandment, they said, okay, this has to be important. Something I want you to do. And the newness here, new from our angle, is something that's brand new, you know, never been used kind of thing. New in the, in the Greek is actually this idea of something that's kind of fresh, sort of a, a resetting, can be a, a different way to look at things, can be something that's sort of remarkable. So when Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, they go, okay, what's the new commandment? And this is the statement that Jesus gives us on how to sort of actually live, you know, not only fall in love, but to stay in love. And here it is. Now, I know some of you are thinking right at this moment, really, that's it? Because this is what Jesus says is the key, the foundation, the basis for, for not only experiencing love, but living out love, of staying in love, is to love each other. Nobody seems to be marking that down, writing it down. <laughs> Somebody's thinking, really, Mike, all week you studied and that's, that's it? Did you, you know? Some of you are thinking, you know, He's here for the first time. I saw your card. I was hoping you were going to give it to him. And that's what you give us, you know? No. Your problem is not with me. And your problem is not even with Jesus. The problem is you've heard that before for a lot of you. And you said, I've tried that. Because I've tried that. I've tried to love them. I've tried to kind of do this, and it hasn't worked. And so it hasn't worked, I don't do it. But in the original language, when Jesus says love each other, it's a continuing present imperative continuation, which simply means you've got to keep loving each other. Keep loving each other. Keep loving each other. Because the reality is at some point in relationship you think, hmm, not so much loving them anymore, and they're not very loving to me, and why would I love them if they don't love me? To which Jesus would simply say, keep loving them. And we don't like that. Because it doesn't do anything for our feelings. Because we want to feel in love. And how can I be loving if I don't feel loving. And some of you would say, oh, you know, no, no, you know, that would be fake, Mike, and I don't want to be fake, I don't want to be unauthentic, you know. But Jesus takes a word that we use as a noun, that I've fallen in love, that love is this great thing, you know, it's a noun we use, you know, I love this, I love that. He takes this noun and he turns it into a verb. Love one another. Keep on loving. Do love. Be loved. Love is more than a feeling. It is a doing. But we are surrounded by a culture, maybe even examples in our life, where love is really more about a feeling than it is a doing. But I would remind you, if you kind of feel like love has got to be this great feeling stuff, <clears throat> that even in the feeling part, you want somebody who's doing love, not just feeling love towards you. You don't want somebody who says, oh, baby, 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 I love you, but doesn't take you out any place. Doesn't bring you gifts or flowers. Doesn't help clean up stuff, make anything. All they contribute is the ooh, baby, baby part to your relationship. <laughs> and while it feels good at the moment, you know that that kind of feeling is not going to work very long. But love is a doing. I love how Andy Stanley puts it. <clears throat> the foundation for staying in love is to make love. A verb. <laughs> but that's Jesus' point. 
the foundation for staying in love. And that's what he's asking these people to do because what he's going to say next about how this is an example. He's kind of saying, listen, the idea of staying in love is to make love a verb, to make it an action, to recognize that it is something I do more than something I feel. Because if you haven't figured it out yet, feelings come and feelings go. Because some of you really did love somebody who never knew you existed. Hopefully you've stopped that by now after all these years, but. <laughs> but loving. And this mix up with feeling gets us in so much trouble. Because I believe God's designed us in a certain way. He's designed us to be walking down the street, we catch eyes of somebody, and we go, hey, hi there, how you doing? Nice to meet you, you know? And got our lines. Some of you guys, how, many of you guys, how many of you guys think you got really good lines? Go ahead and raise your hand. Be proud. <laughs> a, couple of, a couple of guys in the back, they're like, yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. Come tell me them later, all right? I'll share them with everybody because some of us need some lines, right? You know, but... Uh, you know, we got to get the lines, you kind of get this thing, and I think God kind of designs that infatuation, and you, you kind of get the, mmm, baby, oh, baby, oh, he's so cute, you know, all that kind of stuff going on, and I think God can design that, that we'll get that, so that we have enough interest to spend time getting to know somebody, and deciding if we really can fall in love with the whole person, as opposed to just the, the person we see, the person that makes us feel good, you know, the person who, you know, makes our heart go, you know. And later it doesn't seem to be doing that. And we think, oh, I got I to find somebody else to, you know, make me feel good. But our problem with feelings are they come and they go. Because the vast majority of us in this room today, and I'm watching online, the vast majority of us do not, are not in love right now with the very first person we ever fell in love with, right? Some of you are fortunate and you've done that, but that is a rarity, right? In fact, some of you have fallen in love so many times that you have lost count. And our feelings come and our go. You ask any couple, you, you go find somebody, you find somebody that you go, they, they have a great marriage. And you ask them, are you feeling wonderful love every single day of your life? And if they're honest, they'll tell you, <laughs> no. But love is more than a feeling. It's about actions. It's about how I treat the other person, how they treat me, and it all kind of works together. And the thing that we forget is that you can act your way to a feeling much easier than you can feel your way to an action. Because how many times do you get up on a Monday morning or a Wednesday morning or a Sunday morning or whatever morning you got, whether it's to go to work or you're going to go to the gym, and you, you, know, you sit there and the alarm goes off and you reach over and you hit that snooze button because you just don't feel like it at the moment, Right? And Jesus would say, my new commandment, my new imperative for your life, my new direction for your life is that you would love one another. It would be love. Keep on loving. Keep doing those actions because what typically happens is your feelings will follow your actions. And I'm going to prove it to you here this, this morning. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to do something for 10 seconds. So I want you all to concentrate up here. All good? All right? Everybody frown real hard. Don't break your face. Just frown a little bit. All right? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to smile. We're going to hold a smile for 10 seconds, okay? You ready? Here we go. Big smile. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Big smile. Eight, nine, ten. All right, stop. Do you feel a little happier now than you did 10 seconds ago? You know? It's like when you go to a party and you think, oh, I'm going to hate this party, you know? But if you go, no, I'm going to go to make a best of all, figure out something, you kind of begin to look for those things. There, there's something about when we do these actions that, that our hearts, that our minds, that our feelings begin to follow. But sometimes when we hear Jesus' comments, and, and, and for those of us that are kind of, you know, trying to stay in love, and it doesn't feel like it, and I, they don't do it anymore, and Jesus would say, simply, this is my command. Love one another. I know you got your list. Let's be honest, everybody's got a list. You may not tell anybody you got a list, but you got a list, right? Things that just, everybody about the, about the other person. But you know, hey, 
I'm not going to think about that at this moment. Go on. And then Jesus adds even a uh, new, newer, fresh approach to this. Not only to say you need to keep on loving one another, you need, to, you need to love each other, let us love one another as I have loved you. And what he hopes his disciples at that moment would think back to the three, three and a half years they've been together and go, how has Jesus loved us? Let's see, he's put up with us. He's tolerated us. He's let us make mistakes. He's corrected us. He's let us make mistakes again. He's corrected us again. Mistake, correct, yeah. He's, he's let us kind of feel empowered. And at times we kind of get felt too empowered. He's kind of reminding us where we're at. And Jesus is also hoping that just in a matter of hours they will recognize that how he's loved them is enough to go and literally die in their place. To bear the weights of their sins and everybody else's sins. This idea that love in action, not just love in feeling. And Jesus says there's a reason for this. There's a reason I want you to love each other as I have loved you. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, if you're kind of at the last sort of stage of your relationship, you know, and you're ready to go out the door and you're tired, please clearly hear me. This is the, this is the very first of a three-part series, all right? We're going to talk about that on the third week. All right, so you want to come back for that. But right now, I want you just not to kind of fight me on this. I want you just to accept what Jesus is saying here when he says, I want you to love one another. And I know that you're kind of saying, I've tried that, and it's not worked, I'm kind of at this spot. And I don't want you to hear, I do not want you to hear that when, when I'm saying this, that I'm, I'm saying you have to be like Jesus and die for that relationship, all right? That's not what I'm saying. We'll talk about that more in a couple weeks, all right? What I am saying is, on your part, if you want to follow Jesus, want to keep in step with Jesus, this message to you and the message to me, to all of us is, I need you to love one another. And I need you to do it in the way that I've loved. And it's not just the sacrifice part, it's the whole package part of how Jesus looked at this group of people. How Jesus, as he, as he worked in their lives and as they spent time with him, how all those lists that we looked at before about what makes a healthy relationship, you see there. You see Jesus' acceptance of them. You see Jesus giving them security. You see Jesus giving them their approval. He gives them their respect. He, he covers all those kinds of pieces. And then Jesus will say something else. All people will know that you are my followers, the disciples, if you love one another. And how often we read this as the idea of kind of out there, you know, it's our example to the world kind of thing. But what if, what if also it is for your family, for your relationships, and even for yourself? That one of the ways we're reminded that we are his followers is we begin to simply love one another and to keep on loving one another in spite of how we may feel at the moment because when Jesus says that this is not just a noun about how we feel, but this is an action, this is a verb about how we do, how we live, there's a huge payoff for it. But the temptation is especially if you're in kind of a tough relationship at this moment, is to kind of write this off. To kind of hear what Jesus says and then go, I've tried that. You know, all this last week I tried to be loving and they were not loving back, so why would I keep being loving? Well, the basic reason is if you're not loving, you stand no chance of staying in love. At least if you stay loving, you, you provide a little bit of a chance. And I want you to catch what Peter's response is to this, all right? Because again, the setup was, Judas is gone. Jesus said, listen, you know, guys, I'm not going to be here forever. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going away, and I need to know something. Before I leave, I've got to say something. I've given you a new commandment. You need to love one another. You need to keep on loving one another. You need to do it in, in the way that I've loved you. And that's the way that people will recognize what's going on. You'll even recognize that you're my followers by doing this. And here's how, Jesus, or here's how Peter responded. Which I think is great, right? Because typically we just leave it at there. But you got to know that Peter was like, uh, Jesus, question. Where are you going? To which I have to believe Jesus went, oh, 
Peter, you know? I pour it out. I try to give you, give you something that literally will change your life and the lives of this world if people would buy into it, of this idea of loving one another. And I find comfort in Peter's response. Especially in those moments when I sort of kind of blow off what Jesus said. Because I just don't feel it anymore. Just tired of how that person's done stuff. But even one of those closest to Jesus didn't always catch what Jesus said. But that doesn't mean make what Jesus said any less valid. It just means he's, he's dealing with some stuff, some, some people that aren't always the most responsive. So let me wind up today by giving you some, some steps based on what Jesus said to maybe give you sort of a, a, an approach here. First step today as, we, as you leave here today, I hope that you will believe Jesus. I hope you believe Jesus when he says, this is the command, I'm giving this is the direction, that you would love one another. Because it really is the only shot you have at staying in love. Because if you don't love one another, I can tell you, you will not stay in love. In fact, if, if you don't have two people that sort of have some kind of level of love, it's going to be trouble. The second thing is to love the verb part. To do love. To act loving. To be loving as opposed to just kind of feeling loving. Number three, to make a plan. Because again, we make plans on how we're going to fall in love, how we're, how we're going to have our wedding. You know, maybe make a plan about where you're going to live. But you hardly ever make a plan on how are you going to stay in love? How are you going to stay loving one another? And there's a question I've encouraged you to ask before, and I'll put it up here again because I think it still works and applies to this. What's the wise thing to do? That's what's the best. It's going to make me feel better. Not even necessarily what's the right thing to do, but what's the wise thing to do in this moment? And lastly, get outside help. See, I know sometimes, you know, people are a little resistant to, you know, getting some counseling. Some of us, you know, it's our, our kind of uh, our background or, you know, our upbringing and all that kind of stuff kind of says, you know, hey, I'm a man. I should be able to figure this out. I shouldn't have to go to somebody else who's going to tell me how to get this right. So let me just say something directly to you, right? If you don't feel like you need outside help, let me say this in the most gentle, caring way I can, all right? You're an idiot. <laughs> and I mean that in the most positive, gracious way I can say, all right? Because sometimes people need help. And sometimes because of our pride, or sometimes because we don't want to go get help because we know what they're going to tell us to do, and we don't want to do that, so if I don't go, I'm not accountable for that. But everybody at times needs outside help. Everybody. Not just the person sitting next to you, even though they may really need help, all right? <laughs> Not the person sitting a couple rows behind you, around you, but, but all of us. And there's nothing bad, because when we don't believe we need help, we believe that we have the capability within ourselves to fix all problems and issues. You're not Jesus, all right? We need to get over acting that way. And the reality is change happens when we change. And sometimes one of the reasons we don't want to get outside help is it's gonna, they're going to tell us we've got to change something. They might tell them they've got to change something, but they might tell me to change something. I don't need to change. They need to change. And the reality is everybody needs to change. Because you don't have marriage problems or relationship problems. You have people problems that are happening in a marriage or a relationship. Not just because you're in a relationship or married that you're having those problems. You've already had those problems. They're just kind of bringing those things out. So let me wrap this up. You may be done. I say that because I know some of the stories in this room. And I understand. In a couple weeks we're going to talk specifically about what do you do when you're feel like you're done. But at this moment, I want simply to want you to rest everything on this one little word. 
but, okay? So let's say it all, all together. Say but. Because I just think it's funny to say in a church, isn't it? You, know? <laughs> you may be done, but we believe in a God who specializes in resurrections. We believe in a God who breathes life into things that appear dead. And if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be up here. Because I've seen it happen in my own life, and I've seen it in countless other people's lives. But hear me clearly. I'm not saying, oh, this is a guarantee kind of thing. I'm just saying, listen, just for, for a moment. You may feel like you're, I'm done. I can't do anymore. I'm, I'm over. But here's all I'm asking you. Recognize that we do believe that, that while it may not be a probability, it is a possibility. Just like you believe the idea of staying in love may not be you a know, probability. Any statistic you look at for the last decades and decades, 50% of the people that enter into marriage aren't in a marriage very long. 50%. 40% of kids born this year will be born into a single parent home. No, no, no father, no you know, male infant. And I'm not having any kind of, con that's, this is not a point about you know, any of that kind of stuff. I'm just simply saying, look at the, when we talk about probabilities out there, it's like, hmm, there's possibility, but probabilities, uh. But to remind ourselves that we have a God that always deals in possibilities and not probabilities. And here's what I want you to do. If you find yourself at that sort of, I'm over and done with, just simply to try to be open for the next couple of weeks, just the next couple of weeks, to just see what God might say or do. Just give me a couple of weeks, give God a couple of weeks, and at the end of that, if it's time to take that step, I will we'll support you in that. Because it's a reality. But before you do that, I want you to listen to what Jesus calls for all of us to do. That's to love one another.